Okay, welcome everybody to chapter 26 on the reproductive system. Although the reproductive system is a characteristic of living organisms and essential for the survival of the species, it's not technically necessary for the individual's survival. This system's in a state of hibernation until puberty when reproductive organs become functional and mature. Similarities between male and female reproductive organs include the gonads, which are the primary sex organs. These are the most vital organs for both gender, genders. They secrete sex hormones, including testosterone and estrogen. The gonads also make gametes through a process of meiosis. The male gametes are the sperm, and the female gametes are the eggs. Both genders have additional organs and structures called accessory reproductive organs that contribute to the functioning of the reproductive system. Let's take a listen to how meiosis works. Now let's take a look at a comparison of meiosis and mitosis. Prior to meiosis or mitosis, DNA replication occurs. In both meiosis and mitosis, the nuclear membrane breaks down as the DNA organizes into chromosomes. In meiosis, chromosome pairs come together, or synapse, and crossing over occurs, resulting in mixing of the genetic information between the chromosome pairs. The paired chromosomes then align along the central plate of the cell and subsequently separate, one traveling to each end of the cell. In meiosis, a second division sequence occurs, resulting in four cells with half the number of chromosomes. Mitosis involves a single division sequence, resulting in two cells with no net change in the number of chromosomes. Okay, the male reproductive system is shown here. This is a sagittal view through the abdominal pelvic region. The male reproductive system is made up of sperm-producing paired testes found within the scrotum. The sperm travels through the ducts that lead to an opening in the penis. Accessory glands secrete semen, which is a fluid that accompanies the sperm through these tubes or ducts. You see here that <coughs> this system is also closely associated with the urogenital system, hence it's um, sometimes referred to as the urogenital system, the reproductive and urinary system combined. Notice that the urethra in the male is a passageway for both sperm and urine, and that there are four glands that contribute to semen in total, the testes, the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the bulbourethral gland. The testes are oval structures located outside the abdominal pelvic cavity in a sac-like structure composed of skin, smooth muscle, and connective tissue known as the scrotum. Each testis is split into lobules or internal segments that contain loops of seminiferous tubules where the sperm is generated. The testes perform two functions, sperm production and the secretion of androgen hormones, primarily testosterone. Seminiferous tubules contain two cell types, spermatogenic cells and sustentacular cells. These support sperm production. Interstitial or latex cells are found between the seminiferous tubules and produce and secrete androgens, particularly testosterone, into the surrounding interstitial fluid. Myoid cells, the muscle-like cells that surround the seminiferous tubules, contract to push the sperm and testicular fluid through these tubules. Seminiferous tubules of each lobule merge into a single straight tubule that moves sperm into the reed testis. The reed testis is a network of tubules in the posterior testis that transports the sperm to efferent ductules, which carry the sperm from the reed testis to the epididymis, which is the first portion of the duct system. The testicular artery is a branch of the abdominal aorta and provides the testes with arterial blood. The pampiform venous plexus drains blood from the testes into the testicular veins. Both divisions of the autonomic nervous system innervate the testes, which contain a large number of nociceptors and thermoreceptors. So, 
So if we want to trace the path of sperm from where they're produced to where they exit the body, we begin in the coiled seminiferous tubules where they're generated by meiosis. Then we're going to flow to the tubulus rectus, then the retestis, then the efferent ductules, then to the epididymis, and finally to the vas deferens, and then to the three sections of the male urethra, prostatic, membranous, and penile. Sperm travels through a series of ducts bathed in semen secreted by accessory organs, providing nourishment and support. The ducts are involved in ejaculation, in which sperm is expelled from the penis. The epididymis is filled with ductules, the site of sperm maturation and storage. On the superior and posterior surface of each testis, we see a head, a body, and a tail region. The head contains the efferent ductules of the testis and sits on the superior surface. The sperm moves from the head to the narrow body, then onto a small inferior tail. Sperm moves from the efferent ductules into a single ductus epididymis that passes through all the regions of the epididymis. The ductus epididymis is a long coiled tube lined with pseudostratified epithelial cells that display non-motive microvilli known as stereocilia. The microvilli absorb excess testicular fluid and provide nutrients to the sperm, completing the maturation process. The lengths of the ductus epididymis allow the sperm to be stored for months until they're ejaculated or reabsorbed. The vas deferens begins at the tail of the epididymis where the ductus epididymis widens. A long thin tube travels with the testicular arteries, veins, and nerves from the posterior border of the epididymis through a fibrous tunnel into the pelvic cavity. It loops around the ureter and passes over the lateral side and down the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. It terminates in a structure called the ampulla. The mucosa of this tube consists of pseudostratified epithelia and three layers of smooth muscle called muscularis. During ejaculation, the smooth muscle contracts and squeezes the sperm towards the tract. The vas deferens can store sperm for months and reabsorb any sperm that has not been ejaculated. The ejaculatory duct is a short duct and the next structure that receives sperm from the ductus deferens, ampulla, where the accessory organs known as the seminal vesicle are located. The duct travels through another accessory gland on its way to the, its destination, which is the urethra, which belongs both to the reproductive and urinary system as it connects the urinary bladder to the external body surface. In males, it transports transports both urine and semen through three regions, the prostatic urethra, surrounded by the prostate gland, the membranous urethra, which passes through the external urethral sphincter, and the spongy urethra, which runs through the penis and terminates at the external urethral orifice. So what you're looking at here is the top of the male reproductive system split open so that you can see the three parts of the male urethra you can also see the epididymis, the vas deferens, the ampulla, and the seminal vesicles, along with the urinary bladder. And behind here, coming in, you can see the ureters, okay, here and here. The penis delivers sperm into the female reproductive tract and has the following anatomical features. The external penis is made up of the base, which is called the root, the body or shaft, which terminates at the glands where the external urethral orifice is found. Loose skin of the penis forms a circular prepuce or hood known as the foreskin. This portion is often removed by circumcision for hygienic reasons because bacteria live in the crevice and can produce infection. The internal penis has three cylindrical erectile bodies called the corpora, covered by fibrous connective tissue. Each erectile body is a spongy network of connective tissue and smooth muscle with vascular spaces. The corpora cavernosa are paired erectile bodies that split to form the crura at the base of the penis that connects the penis to the ischial rami. The solitary corpus spongiosum expands to form the bulb of the penis at the base and sits between the crura 
where they form the root of the penis and connect the penis to the pelvic bones. The internal iliac arteries provide the branches via the internal penile arteries to the penis. The internal penile arteries give rise to the dorsal and deep arteries. The dorsal arteries supply the penile skin and fascia, corpus spongiosum, and the deep arteries supply the cavernosa. Sensory and motor fibers from both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system innervate the penis. Tactile pressure and temperature receptors are found in abundance here. Both are vital for the sexual stimulation and control of smooth muscle that control the distance of the scrotum from the body wall in order to keep the temperature in the scrotum about 3 degrees below body temp. The penis and scrotum make up the external genitalia and are a component of the male perineum. This is a diamond-shaped region between the thighs bordered by the pubic symphysis anteriorly and the issue tuberosities laterally and the coccyx posteriorly. It's divided into the urogenital triangle which contains the base of the penis and scrotum and the anal triangle which contains the anus. Accessory sex glands of the male reproductive system are exocrine glands that produce the liquid portion of semen. The seminal vesicles are paired exocrine organs found on the posterior surface of the bladder near the ampulla of the ductus deferens. The duct of each seminal vesicle converges with the vas deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. The exterior of each gland is enclosed by a fibrous capsule that covers a thick layer of smooth muscle. The deep mucosal layer is made up of pseudostratified columnar epithelium which secretes seminal fluid. The seminal fluid is a yellowish secretion that makes up 70% of the semen volume made up of fructose which is important for ATP synthesis prostaglandins that stimulate smooth muscle contraction in both genders reproductive tracts and increase sperm motility and coagulating proteins and enzymes from the prostate that combine to form a temporary clot of semen in the female reproductive tract. The pH of the seminal fluid is alkaline to neutralize the acids in the male urethra and the female reproductive tract and this allows the sperm to continue to swim. The prostate is an egg-shaped gland found in the inferior to the urinary bladder that surrounds the urethra and ejaculatory duct. It's made up of about 30 tubular glands dispersed among smooth muscle and connective tissue when it's enclosed in a fibrous capsule. During ejaculation, prostatic smooth muscle contracts, squeezing the prostatic secretions into the prostatic urethra through several ducts. Prostatic secretions make up 30% of the semen volume. They are a milky fluid containing citrate, which is another sugar sperm can use for ATP synthesis, PSA, and other enzymes that dissolve semen clots in the female reproductive tract to allow the sperm to move further into the tract, and antimicrobials that inhibit bacterial growth to decrease the risk of infection in the female reproductive system. The pH is alkaline to neutralize acids in the urethra and the female reproductive tract. The bulbo-urethral glands are marble-sized paired glands found at the base of the penis on either side of the membranous urethra. Each gland has a short duct that connects it to the urethra and they secrete an alkaline mucus that helps neutralize acidic urine remaining in the urethra in response to sexual stimulation. It also lubricates the gland's penis during intercourse. Semen is a sticky whitish mixture of sperm that makes up 5% of its volume and all the fluids from the different anatomical structures the sperm traveled through. A typical ejaculate is between 2.5 and, and 5 milliliters and contains between 700 and 400 to 750 million sperm cells. Five minutes post-ejaculation, semen coagulate due to activities of clotting proteins from the seminal vesicles and enzymes from the prostate that prevent the semen from leaking out of the female reproductive tract, ensuring that they'll make their way eventually up the vagina, through the cervix, into the uterus, into the oviduct, and eventually find the egg. After 15 to 30 minutes, the semen clot breaks up due to the activity of PSA and anticoagulants in the prostate. 
sperm cells are gradually released from the clot, activated, and begin their ascent up the, male, up the female reproductive tract. The alkaline pH of semen helps make the sperm fully motile and allow them to begin capacitation. This is a process that enables the sperm to penetrate and fertilize an immature female gamete. It's completed in the female reproductive tract where secretions prepare sperm cells, plasma membranes to fuse with the female gamete. Prostaglandins stimulate contractions in the female reproductive tract and thin the mucus, allowing the sperm access further into the female reproductive tract and increasing the likelihood of fertilization. Antimicrobials from the prostate kill some bacteria, including E. coli. Let's take a listen to BPH and prostate cancer. Hello, I'm Dr. Naeem Rahman, and I would like to discuss prostatitis, a term used to describe inflammatory conditions of the prostate gland. Prostatitis can affect men of any age group, although it is more common in younger men. It is estimated that 50% of men will experience this disorder during their lifetime. There are many classifications for prostatitis. Acute bacterial prostatitis is an inflammation of the prostate gland caused by bacteria. An infected prostate can cause painful urination and ejaculation, urinary frequency and urgency, pain in the penis, testicles, and the area below the scrotum and rectum. Usually a prolonged four-week course of oral antibiotics is sufficient for treatment. Rarely, hospital admission with IV antibiotics is required. Chronic prostatitis is recurrent inflammation of the prostate. Symptoms are less severe, but the treatment can be challenging and variable. Oftentimes, antibiotics will not resolve symptoms, and treatment rests with analgesics, warm baths, and behavioral modification. Diagnosis of prostatitis is achieved by assessing for symptoms, digital rectal examination with a prostate massage, and a urine culture. I invite you to explore our website and see some of the treatment options we have and better yet, make an appointment to discuss your treatment options in person. Some anatomical func and functional features of these components of the male reproductive tract include the scrotum, which is found between the thighs and contains the testes. We also see a midline septum dividing the scrotum into two internal compartments, one per testis. The rafe demarcates the septum on the external scrotum. This is a visible line that runs posteriorly to the anus and anteriorly along the ventral surface of the penis. The scrotum wall contains an outer layer of skin, superficial fascia, and a layer of smooth muscle called the dartos. The spermatic cord is a tube extending from the scrotum and contains the ductus deferens, blood and lymphatics, and nerves, and leads to the pelvic cavity. The cremaster muscle is smooth muscle that controls the height of the testes. It enters the pelvic cavity through the external inguinal canal, and terminates at the inguinal canal. It leads to the abdominal cavity. Both the scrotum and spermatic cord work together to support sperm production by regulating temperature. Normal core temperature, 37 degrees, is too warm for mass production of, sp of viable sperm, so the scrotum is generally 3 degrees cooler. And so when it's warm outside, the testes hang further from the body cavity, and when it's cold, they pull up closer to the body cavity. This is why it's been shown that men who wear um, boxer shorts tend to be more fertile than men that wear tidy whities Temperature regulation is managed via blood vessels arranged in a way that allow heat transfer from arteries to veins that carry blood back into the body. This drops the scrotal temperature the scrotum temperature can also be increased or decreased by altering the distance from the body. When cold, the scrotum is drawn closer to the body, and when warm, it moves away. The surface area of the scrotum is minimized in cold weather as well, reducing heat loss. The temperature goes up. The surface area of the scrotum is increased when it's too warm, allowing for more heat loss, and thus the temperature drops. Now let's take a look at the physiology of the, fem of the male reproductive system as we examine spermatogenesis. Spermatogonia are the cells from which sperm cells arise. The spermatogonia divide by mitosis. One daughter cell remains a spermatogonium and the other becomes a primary spermatocyte. 
the primary spermatocyte divides by meiosis to form secondary spermatocytes. Secondary spermatocytes divide again to form spermatids. The spermatids differentiate into sperm cells. What you're looking at here is a diagram of spermatogenesis and you can see a developmental sequence that begins with the spermatogonia at the periphery of the seminodemphorous tubule. They mitotically divide generating diploid primary spermatocytes. Once the primary spermatocytes have been developed one of these will undergo meiosis one producing two haploid secondary spermatocytes crossing through the blood testis barrier in the process. The two secondary spermatocytes undergo meiosis II to produce a total of four haploid spermatids, which then elongate and undergo spermiogenesis to form the sperm, which are technically morphologically ready for fertilization, but they are yet un as of yet, not capable of using their flagella. So they have to be um, rendered competent to swim in the epididymis. Sustentacular cells, or Sertoli cells, surround spermatogenic cells and provide support. They're bound together by tight junctions and extend from the basement membrane to the seminiferous tubule lumen. This microscopic anatomical arrangement forms the blood testis barrier, preventing the immune system in the blood from detecting newly formed antigens on newly formed genetically unique sperm cells. Spermatogonia and sustentacular cells are self cells capable of interacting with immune cells and other components in the blood. Sustentacular cells also perform functions vital for normal spermi spermiogenesis. They provide structural support for stem cell development and they secrete testicular fluid and transport sperm to the seminiferous tubule. They provide nutrients for dividing cells and provide androgen binding protein and inhibin to regulate spermatogenesis. They also phagocytize damaged spermatogenic cells and excess cytoplasm released from maturing spermatids. Spermiogenesis is the process of sperm maturation involving cellular shape and size changes. It begins in the testes and sper as the spermatids elongate, shedding excess cytoplasm. An acrosome soon develops and covers the nucleus and helps with fertilization of female gametes. Mitochondria increase in number and move to developing flagellal sites. The spermatids separate from the sustentacular cells and are released into the seminiferous tubule lumen. The sperm tids develop a head, a midpiece, and tail as they mature into sperm. The head contains the nucleus and the acrosome, which contains enzymes that are going to penetrate the protective layer around the egg, the corona radiata and zona pellucida. The midpiece has mitochondria generating ATP that power the flagella, and the tail is made of a protein called flagellum, and generates a whip-like motion as it converts chemical potential energy and ATP into kinetic energy of movement. The sperm are still non-motile as they migrate to the epididymis, where though complete maturation, the trip takes 12 days to reach the epididymis tail, where the sperm cells will remain viable for months. The entire process, including spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis, takes a little over two months to complete. Sperm cells that are not ejaculated within a few months get reabsorbed. Testosterone is the main hormone involved in the regulation of spermatogenesis and male reproductive physiology. It's regulated by a multi-tiered negative feedback loop. The hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis regulates hormones involved in testosterone production and testicular function. The first tier control begins with gonadotropin releasing hormone made by the hypothalamus. Second tier control is the anterior pituitary reacting to GnRH 
producing follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone. Third tier control is where the testes targeted by the gonadotropins are going to increase production of testosterone and the production of sperm. Luteinizing hormone stimulates the interstitial cells to kick out testosterone. FSH stimulates sustentacular cells to secrete androgen binding protein that keeps testosterone near the spermatogenic cells and inhibin which regulates the production of the gonadotropins through negative feedback. Ultimately testosterone stimulates spermatogenesis and the development of male characteristics. Elevated testosterone and inhibin levels are sensed in the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary causing a negative feedback loop to close. <clears throat> Inhibin decreases the release of FSH. Testosterone reduces GnRH secretion. Once the HPG axis is established, testosterone levels and spermatogenesis remain fairly stable until the individual reaches a certain age and then the levels taper off. To reproduce, sperm cells must travel deep into the female reproductive tract. Intercourse is the mechanism that op optimizes the chances for fertilization. Erection and ejaculation are basic phases of the male response. In erection, we see an enlargement and stiffening of the penis caused by engorgement of blood allows the penis to enter the vagina. In the non-aroused state, the penis is flaccid as blood vessels supplying the penis constrict. During sexual arousal, parasympathetic reflexes release nitric oxide from blood vessel endothelial cells, relaxing arterial walls. The arterioles dilate in the blood sinuses in the erectile tissue, and this allows for a large volume of blood to enter the tissue. The increasing blood flow and the widening sinuses produce an erection. This is partially sustained by compression of the veins that drain the penis as well. The corpus spongiosum does not become rigid as the corpora cavernosa allows sperm and semen to travel through the urethra unimpeded. Ejaculation is the process of, sperm ex of semen expulsion from the penis. It's under sympathetic nervous system control and it occurs in two stages. In emission, movement of sperm, testicular fluid, prostate, and seminal vesicle secretions into the urethra takes place. In expulsion, semen, sperm, and fluids of other regions of the reproductive system accumulate in the urethra. This generates sensory impulses that are processed in the sacral spinal cord. Motor neurons from the spinal cord stimulate rhythmic contraction of the skeletal muscle at the base of the erectile columns of the penis promoting expulsion of semen from the urethra. Orgasm is a time period during which feelings of pleasure are experienced and coincides with ejaculation under normal circumstances. In resolution, we see relaxation, which follows orgasm, and ejaculation. The blood vessels in the erectile tissue and the blood sinuses constrict, and this forces blood out of the penis. A refractory or latent period occurs after ejaculation that varies in duration where a man can't achieve another orgasm. Infertility is the inability to produce a pregnancy after one year of unprotected intercourse. About 40% of all infertility cases result from male infertility due to low sperm count. Normal levels are between 40 and 750 million sperm per ejaculate, a count of about less than 15 million sperm per milliliter of semen usually indicates infertility. Low sperm count can result from damage to the testis, physical trauma, radiation disease, or developmental defect. During normal development, the testes begin forming inside the abdominal pelvic cavity and then descend into the scrotum. If the testes don't descend, and this is a condition known as cryptokaidism, sperm cells won't be produced. In addition, inadequate secretion of GnRH, FSH, 
LH or testosterone can drop the sperm count. It's important to understand that the reason a low sperm count can result in infertility is due to the fact that sperm have a difficult time finding the egg. Number one, when the sperm enter the female reproductive tract, many of them will engage in efforts to fertilize the vagina, the cervix, the lining of the uterus, okay? And they're not sentient, so they don't realize that what they're doing is pointless. Of those that don't do that, half will swim up the wrong oviduct and miss the egg altogether. Of those that do find the correct oviduct, many will swim past the egg, some will fail to reach the egg, and so at the end of the day, you just have a few dozen sperm actually finding and attaching to the egg, and of those few dozen, under normal circumstances, only one will actually manage to reach the egg cell membrane and affect fertilization. <clears throat> and so this is why we say that if you're below 15 million per milliliter, you're what's called functionally infertile. Testosterone levels rise dramatically at puberty, and this leads to, beginning at age 12 to 14 in males, the hypothalamus becoming less sensitive to feedback inhibition from low testosterone levels and androgens from the adrenal cortex. The uninhibited hypothalamus kicks out more GnRH. The result is that we kick out more LH and FSH. Increased testosterone levels from the gonads trigger spermatogenesis and secondary sex characteristics. Once spermatogenesis begins, males are capable of reproduction. The secondary characteristics that develop first include the um, changes associated with puberty, such as growth of pubic, axillary, and facial hair, increased hair growth in specific regions of the body, such as the chest, enlargement of the larynx, thickening of the vocal cords, an Adam's apple, and a deepening voice. The skin thickens and sebaceous glands increase their secretions. Testosterone causes somatic effects, many of which are anabolic in nature. Bone density and hematocrit and muscle mass go up, metabolic rate increases, and erythrocyte production increases as testosterone jacks up erythropoietin secretion. Testosterone also influences behavior, which is the basis for male libido, which is the desire for sexual activity. As the male ages, we enter what's called andropause, which is a period in which reproductive function declines in men. Changes occur gradually, sometimes in the fifth decade of life, but vary depending on the individual. The size and weight of the testes drops, the number of sustentacular and interstitial cells decline. Sustentacular cells secrete reduced inhibin and interstitial cells produce less testosterone. Both lead to an increased GnRH as negative feedback is not triggered. GnRH increases production of FSH and LH. These levels remain elevated, indicating that the testes are not producing enough testosterone. Reduced levels of testosterone result in gradual lowering of production of sperm, depressed mood and fatigue, loss of muscle mass, and a reduction in bone density. Prostate gland hypertrophy is one of the most noticeable changes during climacteric. It can compress the urethra, leading to difficulties with urination. ED is a result of <coughs> psychological and or physiological changes that inhibit erection. Psychological influences include stress, depression, and anxiety. Physical causes include cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, tobacco, and alcohol. And prescription meds may also play a role. Older men have a greater risk because they are more likely to have related physical conditions. Also, the amount of connective tissue in the erectile portion of the penis increases with age, and this reduces blood flow. Treatments include medications that permit blood vessels supplying the penis to dilate, thereby maintaining an erection, 
and surgery that repairs damaged blood vessels or a penile implant. The female reproductive system by comparison to the male is much different. In addition to similarities between the female and male reproductive system, the female system has to be capable of supporting a developing embryo and providing nourishment to the growing infant. Internal female genitalia are the ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina. The peritoneum extends down on either side of the uterus, creating two regions between the uterus and urinary bladder and rectum. The vesicouterine pouch, which is seen here, and the rectouterine pouch, which is seen here. When we pick up next time, we'll discuss more about the female reproductive anatomy and we'll begin an exploration of human development, which we will continue in the final chapter. Remember to study this material as it will show up on the PRSs and the exams. And I'll see everybody in the next podcast.